wanted to acknowledge the country that we meet on today as the traditional lands of the Ghana. Um, I also wanted to just to acknowledge our, our pop-up working group that's organised this event and indeed the previous one. So Rebecca, thank you to you. Uh, Darren Humphreys, I don't know whether Darren's here with us today, but Jen, I saw you before. Um, Alison Wright, Sandy Gunter and Jessica Fruin. Thanks all to you for organising such a great event. And then I also probably, before Elaine ducks off, wanted to take the opportunity to thank her and indeed Carlene uh, for being uh, willing to participate in an event like this. So we're very fortunate to have friends such as you um, and to be able to draw on your experience. Um, so look, what I'm hoping to talk about today is I've got three key themes for what I wanted to discuss with you. So initially, what's shaped my views on inclusive leadership and, and to, to what extent, what have I been doing around that in uh, my role as a leader? Um, just a quick sort of snapshot in terms of where we're at with women in leadership in DW because I, I currently chair that group um, and we're at a critical juncture, I guess, with what we're going to do with uh, diversity and inclusion going forward in the new department. So I just want to touch base on that with the group and then there's five clear takeaways from me. So look, so what's what's moulded me, what's brought me to, to this point in my career and I suppose what's shaped my views around inclusive leadership. Um, so as Brendan said, so I was, uh, I was raised in the country and um, uh, my dad was actually a bank manager, Elaine, and I can remember in, uh, I were in Alice Springs and Quorn in my very young days going to staff shows which were predominated by blokes who were both tellers and bank managers and lenders and so very much brought up in that, that sort of, or he worked in that, that blokey sort of culture. Um, but that was uh, very much offset by the fact that I had uh, two sisters, one of which is in the room today, so I need to tread carefully. Hello, Nicole. Um, and and obviously a couple of wonderful grandmothers and, and a fantastic mother. So um, whilst I guess um, my upbringing would be regarded as being, you know, conventional uh, middle white Australian, I think we, we were brought up with very strong sense of value and respect for whoever we were engaging with, regardless of their gender and background. And um, to be frank, that's framed the way I've approached my work ever since I joined the department. I think... Um, We've got a wonderful department in terms of the, the types of people that we attract to work uh, with us and we're blessed um, in terms of the, you know, the people that we bring the, and the passion that they have for the vocation. Um, so that I've found that really easy to engage, you know, that sort of value set in, in what we've got. That being said, we've got some work to do and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, so I suppose more recently, um, one of the things that uh, I, I engaged in back in 2016, which has really had a profound impact on uh, my approach to inclusive leadership, was the, the government's initial reverse mentoring program. So I was part of the, the initial whole of government pilot project, which um, Linda Hundemark, and I don't think Linda's here today, um, invited, to, uh, invited me to partner with her. So she was my uh, mentor and I was her mentee and um, so we had a, a six month program there which was run by Anna Lee and pretty much what it encompassed was a, a, a range of uh, senior male government executives and uh, a, a female female mentor and um, whilst I guess before that, um, before that program I thought I had a reasonable grasp of some of the challenges, I'd have to say that that process was actually quite sobering for me and I'll, I'll just step through some of the things that we did. So it really was a process of listening, um, reflection and action and to the blokes in the room I would encourage you, I'll, I'll talk about this later, but one of the opportunities you've got is to actually, you don't need a program to do this, you can actually engage with women in your workforce if you're in a leadership role and and take up the opportunity. So um, I would strongly recommend that. So a cycle of listening, reflection and action, um, which shaped a whole stack of questions. And uh, one of the things that we then decided to do was, um, so I'd heard from Linda around her experiences, but then also um, we agreed it'd be a good idea subject to the agreement of some of her direct reports, all of which who were women. Um, to sit down and go through the same process through a listen and learn session with them. So I was very fortunate to gain their trust and had five additional sessions and 
you know, I could talk for hours around what I heard, um, but there were some consistent themes that I suppose emerged from that, which, um, you know, probably strongly shaped my views and my approach to this stuff over the last two to three years. So um, all of the women that I spoke to were actually uh, working mums and all of them at some point in their career had had difficulty in re-entering the workforce in a structured, uh, systematic, valued manner. So that, that notion that there had been a, a handbrake placed on their career, based on their decision to have children, and that they, as such their career had stalled. All of them had experienced either quite overt conscious or unconscious bias in the workplace. Um, all of them had experienced some form of sexism or inappropriate behaviour. Um, but then equally, based on the feedback that we got, the observation was that on balance, the public sector had a better value set around that than the private sector, notwithstanding that certain sections of the public sector are more challenging than others, and that'll probably bring me to my next step. So it was a fantastic opportunity, um, really, I suppose, crystallised my thinking around um, the challenges that we got in front of us. Um, and. Uh, something that the department followed up the following year, so Stuart Paul and Yvette Coulton were subsequently involved in that program and, and similarly got some really rich results from it. But it's, for me, it's actually a really simple activity that, as a takeaway that leaders, male leaders in particular, can implant in, in their workforces if they're serious about trying to shift views on this and raise awareness. So look, the, the second one for me that, I again, I, I am fortunate to have been engaged in is uh, more recently in 2017, um, the AFAC, which is the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Council, it is a big gobful, I know, um, initiated a male champions of change uh, project. And um, in, in essence, what that was, um, what that arose from was a, a number of reports, either in pending or publicly released, that were really damning around the culture of the fire and emergency services. So if you want to talk about um, workforces that lack diversity and are, are moulded in, in a single state, then you don't need to look much further than fire and emergency services. So, um, you know, the, the stereotypical, yeah, big, male, burly firefighter, white Anglo-Saxon, that, that, permeates, that permeates that culture and that sector. And clearly there are differences between organisations, but sector-wide there are systemic issues there. So uh, Stuart Ellis, who's the Chief Executive of AFAC, um, approached Elizabeth Broderick, who many of you would know, a former um, Equal Opportunities and Human Rights Commissioner who'd established the Male Champions of Change and Hence, in March 2017, the AFAC Male Champions of Change uh, group was formed and we're blessed to have um, Kristen Hilton, who's the current uh, Victorian Equal Opportunities and Human Rights Commissioner. And those of you who follow the press would know that she's been uh, in a running battle in the Supreme Court around the release of a report with the United Firefighters Union over in Victoria on exactly these sorts of matters. So. Um, it's, 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 it's been quite serendipitous to have um, Kristen involved in this over the last 18 months. Um, so the, the committee comprises of all the fire and emergency services chiefs, commissioners and senior land management, uh, either CEOs or officers from across the country. So there's two dozen of us and surprise, surprise, the majority of them are blokes. So one of the reasons we've got the group is we've actually got to try and shift that. And I'll, I'll just step through briefly what we're trying to do there. So our purpose statement was is to advance gender equity, inclusive cultures and achieve significant and sustainable improvements in the representation of women in our workplaces, including senior leadership positions amongst our paid staff and volunteers. So it's been running for nearly two years now um, and we've had a, a four-stage a four process which we've engaged in. So the first, the first part of the process was actually around getting a sense as individuals of what sort of leadership shadow we cast and to do that, we, we went off and discussed with a number of uh, our direct reports, um, predominantly women, around a, a series of structured questions around how do they perceive our role in terms of diversity and inclusion, particularly, uh, particularly around gender. We then subsequently ran a, a, a series of listen and learn sessions across the sector with a, a wide, wide range of staff to get a sense of how people were feeling. Now, 
one of the um, the interesting juxtapositions with that is that at the same time there's a whole stack of reports that have come out where people have confidentially quite you know quite overtly said this is the way they're thinking so to try and marry those two up i think for the the relevant chiefs has been quite um quite a productive but also sobering exercise and then we've worked on defining a, a number of action groups of which we've landed on seven and that we're now in train in, in terms of implementing those so i'll, I'll step through what we what we're doing there so there's an action group around inclusive leadership, uh, one around flexible workplaces, which is one that I actually sit on, and um, our work around flexibility with uh, under the women in leadership strategies really, it's positioned us really well to be able to influence that. Um, one around talent development, uh, communication, community engagement systems, and then reporting. So there is, um, particularly on reporting, a, a strong desire to actually measure our success as opposed to, you know, it's one thing to raise awareness and to set strategies, another thing to actually as a sector try and shift what we're doing and, and keep ourselves accountable. Um, uh, the other, I suppose, take home point for me uh, out of this experience is that we've been able to access experiences from other male champions of change. So we've got, um, amongst those various committees across the country, some seriously big hitters in terms of um, private sector organisations, all of which have got, you know, the, 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 the same, uh, same range of issues that we, we're currently, um, currently working through and many of them are, are well along that journey. So to be able to glean um, intelligence and strategies from people like James Fazzino, who used to run Incitec Pivot, things like that, it's, it's been a really, really quite productive, valuable experience. Um, look, I, I'll now just move to what, um, what Wild has, has been doing. And I, um, Jay, uh, Brenton touched on that before, as did Rebecca. Um, I've, I've been chairing the committee since Carolyn Crozer Barlow left us in April, so she's gone over to education. I do want to acknowledge at this point the, the outstanding work that she's done with the committee to get it to this point. I think what we've been able to do in one, developing the strategy, but then two, um, roll out the action plan that we have and then deliver on it to the extent that we have is, it, you know, is a real credit to her, but then also the other committee members, including Rhiannon, where are you? There you are. Um, as the executive officer, you should feel really proud of what you've been able to do. Um, look, we've, we've got some work to do though. Um, so I just wanted to reflect with the group because this is, this is a plug to the people in this room. Um, it's not a big committee, um, but we're always looking for, for more, um, more recruits. So here's a summary, I guess, of what we've been doing recently. So. All of you be aware, and many of you would have been involved in the Flexibility for the Future program, which was a whole of government initiative, but something that I think the department's grabbed by the horns and done an outstanding job of, so much so that it was recognised, you know, we've won an award. Um, and the feedback from my colleagues uh, in AFAC is that, yeah, we're very well advanced compared to what some of the emergency services organisations are doing in that space. Um, the I am video, and there's a few faces around the room here that were part of that. That's just a fantastic bit of awareness. Emma Jinman. Um, <laughs> um, role description reviews for gender bias. Um, that Some really good tangible work there. Um, our 50-50 panel pledge, and you know today is an example of that. Um, three wise leaders events, so this is the second of those series. Um, and then, you know, perhaps, most tangibly, if we talk about the targets, our, our targets regarding gender balance in our leadership roles, um, yeah, we're close to realising them. I think one of the challenges that we'll need to work through is uh, with the reform process that we're now going through is that we don't lose sight of those. And that, that's a real challenge for the executive to ensure that we maintain that momentum and that this work doesn't become a point in time. Um, so where to next? I guess, um, the committee's been doing some work over the last few months to, to define where, where we're going next. And I suppose what we can share with you at the moment is that we're likely to go with a proposal to exec around um, broadening the role of the committee to um, broader diver matters of diversity and inclusion, um, while still maintaining a strong focus on the work that we've done under this strategy. Um, 
that strategy once once it's uh, developed will be consulted on. But I just uh, take the opportunity now to flag that with the with the group that's in the room. Um, the more engagement that we can have in developing new strategies such as these, the better, because ultimately the staff need to own these. Um, you know, leadership um, leadership can set the strategy, but we need to actually embed these changes through the staff. So my five key takeaways for you today. Um, the first one is make the space for the conversation. So um, taking time to actually discuss these matters with your teams as opposed to treating them as an optional extra is really important. You can't embed changes in culture or changes in um, system without actually making that time. So events like this are important, but take that back if you're in a leadership role and actually talk about it in your team meetings. The second one is, um, uh, and this has ov obviously been a, a point of real um, contention, I think, is around setting targets or goals. So I'm strongly of the view that if you don't know um, what you're aiming for, you're not going to you're not going to hit your mark. So setting targets and keeping yourselves accountable against those targets is the only way that you're actually going to shift real change. And that doesn't matter what the target is, whether it's about balance in leadership numbers or whether it's um, the way your role descriptions are prepared or um, the way you recruit for staff, there needs to be hard targets if you're actually going to shift change, shift, uh, shift the, the status quo and change behaviour. Um, leaders, it is really important that you model the behaviours you want from staff. So um, there is a you know, strong case there of, for all of us that have got management and leadership roles to live those targets, be the culture that you want the organisation or your, your branch or your division to be. Um, there's also a strong role there, I think, for us to, as leaders to educate, um, educate people, but then also put lines in the sand and not tolerate behaviour that's outside of those, those expected, uh, expected norms. My fourth point is, um, this, this is important, I'll make this point to the blokes in the room, Men have got a really big role to play here. So this is not about women fixing women's problems or fixing women's problems. This is actually, it, it, it in, includes men as well. So um, if I take flexible work as an example, there is a stigma around, um, historically, I think men in our workforce availing themselves of flexible work. There is. So flexible work, historically, in my view, has become the province of mums returning from work. It's more about mums than it is about dads. That's got to change. It's got to change. If you heap all of that on women, it won't, it, you won't shift it. You won't shift it. Um, the other one is around part-time work. So people, um, people coming, I hate the term part-time work, so it devalues what you do. So the language we've got around work needs to change. You work a certain number of hours a week. That's not part of the time. That doesn't diminish your contribution. We need to shift that. Um, and men have a role to play in that. And then the, my last point of my last takeaway, I guess, is around persistence. So this isn't a passing fad. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do, it, because it drives greater productivity um, in our workforce, because it... Um, improves the performance of our workforce because diversity in our thinking um, is, is actually a good thing to do that improves the outcomes that we, we deliver for the uh, community of South Australia as a public servant. We need to mirror, we need to mirror the community that we serve. We can't mirror the community that we serve if we don't value diversity. Um, Strategy without action is just talk. So um, I think one of the great strengths of what we've done thus far as a department, um, you know, from my perspective, is that yes, we've had a strategy, but there's a whole stack of really tangible actions that we've delivered through that strategy. So it's about maintaining that momentum. And once you put that stake in the ground, actually continuing to normalise those sorts of activities in our day to day work. So I think based on that, Brenton, I'll leave it there. Thanks, folks. Oh, give generously. Yeah.